Good evening and welcome to this live webinar on Trace Together Goes Open Source, Why It Matters, organized by the Progress Singapore Party. My name is Dylan, I'm the MC for tonight, and Shiming will be our moderator. If you have any question later, please ask in the Q&A function and I will ask the question for you. Without further ado, let's hand over to Shiming. Thank you very much, Dylan. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks for attending today. If you're not queuing at NTUC or for food at the mall, thanks for tuning in tonight. So um, if you have seen the Facebook um, live event, there are some questions that we have sent across. So I'll be repolling this uh, to everybody on Zoom to today. So without further ado, I shall begin the poll. You should be seeing this uh, opening poll on your screen right now. So do give us your feedback, whether you have uh, downloaded Trace together and so on. So to give you some background on our Facebook page, we have seen um, about 60% of our audience saying that they have downloaded Trace together. Uh, and for the reasons why they have not considered, um, most of them mentioned that it's from the privacy standpoint and, their pri and it's more of a privacy concern. So we'll take about another five seconds just to gather all the responses from our attendees today. Okay, I shall end the poll right now and gather the response that we have seen. So um, to, er to everyone, we have seen that, uh, from, I mean, from the audience today, we have seen that 70% of you have not downloaded Trace Together. And again, about 80% of you mentioned about privacy concerns. I think this, these are, are pretty similar to national statistics. And yeah, thank you very much once again, one, once again for your, your feedback. So good evening and welcome to one of the many PSP public webinar series. These are extraordinary times and we face an extraordinary challenge on many fronts during the COVID-19 pandemic. This requires a whole of society effort as much as we all eagerly await for the CB to be lifted after the 1st of June. Life, however, will not go back to normal. Different strategies and precautions such as trace together, safe entry and wearable dongles may likely become mainstream. I'm Shen Ming, a member of PSP, and I welcome Harish and our distinguished panelists to give us some insights into the work that they do. So uh, without further ado, could you tell us a bit more about yourselves? Perhaps starting with uh, Harish. Hi, Shang Ming, thank you very much. Um, my name is Harish. I uh, assisted uh, in the uh, uh, open sourcing of the Trace Together project uh, that was done by uh, and funded by GovTech. Uh, I'm with a, a private sector company dealing with open source technology, and uh, one of the things that I've been able to do over the years was to you know, get involved in open source technologies and how that helps to drive the adoption and the innovation in a, a wider space. So uh, that's really the reason why I you know, offered to help uh, uh, GovTech to open source it and do it the right way so that the rest of the world can benefit from such uh, technology as well. So yeah, over to you, um, Brian. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Tan. I lead, uh, I'm a lawyer in private practice and I lead a technology practice. Uh, we do quite a lot of things for tech companies, but one of the things that we do uh, is to help them with their data protection obligations. Uh, so making sure that uh, whatever products that they come up with, the services that they run uh, are compliant with data protection laws, including Singapore data protection laws. And should there uh, be a breach that occurs, uh, sometimes we are also called up to help assist in uh, the remediation and uh, the recovery efforts uh, when there's such a breach. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Ben. Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a researcher in cyber and homeland defense national security policy issues at a policy research think tank in RSIS and NTU. And my background, I was a lawyer. I was also a CIO for half of my career in the private sector. And I'm also currently, concurrently, the Chief Data Officer for AI Singapore. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, so as part of our Q&A today, uh, we will be inviting our panelists to answer a few questions. So um, starting from Harish, can you tell us a little bit more about Trace Together and what is its intent? Are there trade-offs, for example, like battery life, privacy. From how I see it, it's really, um, there's two tensions here. One, you know, of, of public good versus, you know, uh, releasing private data. How do you reconcile this, these two things? 
All right. Um, let me just share my screen if I may. Uh, Trace together as an idea is basically trying to figure out how best to answer a very simple question. Um, and the question, uh, sorry, the question is, uh, you know, what is the problem that we're trying to be so uh, solve in this case? And why is it that we're trying to solve this particular problem? Um, so recognizing that contact tracing is what we're trying to achieve as a, as a society, as a nation. Uh, and the reason why you need contact tracing is because you want to figure out uh, whether you have been exposed. And if you have been exposed, what is the mitigation efforts? How can you also figure out who else you may have uh, passed it on? And also to find out who may have given it to you. So this entire web is really what we're trying to, uh, that, that, we, that needs to be solved. And in solving that, you, you need to have the right technology uh, uh, to, to help you track something like that. In 2003, when SARS happened, we did not have the, the kinds of technology we have today uh, to be able to do that kind of tracking. And part of the problem with uh, uh, the nature of the current situation is that this is a lot more contagious and has got a much longer gestation period before it, it shows up in an, in an individual. So the, the nature of this problem was a, a fairly difficult thing to solve. And the way you needed to solve it was trying to find ways to gather the data, but more importantly, as the third point on my slide says, we wanted to ensure that the, the privacy of the individual is honored. Uh, it is a very, very, very fine line that has to be walked in order to make sure that you do not uh, cross into an area where you are infringing on the privacy of an individual while trying to do the greater good, which is to protect the individual and the, the surrounding community uh, from having uh, to, to continue with this uh, current pandemic. Uh, so that's really part of the, the story behind it. And so from my perspective, if this is to be done uh, and done well, we need to have an element of trust because this is you know, fairly intrusive into all of our lives. We are already severe, seriously inconvenienced by the fact that we have to stay at home. And if you have to go out, what else are we supposed to be having to uh, sacrifice in terms of uh, our own personal uh, requirements? So one of the things that uh, uh, the open sourcing of a technology like this brings is the element of uh, trustworthiness. Uh, in the Singapore context, there is a relatively high level of trust in the government and how the government does what it does. There is a relatively high compared to other countries. But that in itself is insufficient as a, a, uh, in order to move the entire and find a solution for the problem at hand. We also require a means for us to, when you do need to gather data as has been done, what is being done with the data? How is the data being collected? Where is it being stored? What is the data expiry date, as it were? Does it have a way to you know, uh, be uh, de uh, deleted from the entire system? And what guarantees are there? What is the legal basis for that? So this is a, a, a difficult thing to do unless you have additional steps put into place. And one of the additional steps was to make sure that the at least the application that is running in my devices that is going to collect all this data is also uh, inspectable. Can I check it? Can I verify that it is indeed what it claims to do and nothing more? And that is the reason why, you know, this, if you open source the code base, a lot more people, it has proven to around the world that this is a, a fantastic model to raise the level of trustworthiness across all kinds of solutions. And in this specific instance, with this particular specific challenge that we have across society, we need to build a lot more trust. Trust in government is one part of the equation. Trust in the technology is another part of the question. Uh, a third one is, can I trust the data that is being, going to be potentially collected? How, what do I need to do to trust that? So these are the various levels of trust that we need to raise up at some point in order for the rest of the uh, community to be happy to use uh, uh, these, uh, these technologies. So, it does throw up many, many challenges. Technologies being who they are, a lot of them say, I'll take the, the shiny new object that uh, the, the thing that first comes across my mind and let's try and implement it and run with it. I think 
what we have to be very, very careful is while technology is a part of the solution, it is not the solution. It is just one more quiver in the, in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the holder for, for us to try and fight this particular uh, pandemic. Uh, and that's really what uh, this, uh, this uh, application helps to achieve, which is minimize the exposure of data that is personally identifiable and yet try and maximize the, in, uh, the uh, impact on society. And that it's a very, very fine balance. And this particular app, I think, in my opinion, does it reasonably well. Could we do better? Yeah, there's some other uh, some ideas that we could do even better than that. But as it stands now, I think we have a, a baseline to start from. I shall, I shall pause here for a while. All right. Thank you, Harish. Um, like you have rightfully mentioned, I think Trace Together is part of uh, the toolkit in order to fight this uh, pandemic. So uh, to that note, about 1.4 million or about 25% of the population have downloaded the app. So for Trace Together to be effective, 75% of or more will be ideal, as uh, many you know like um, forms of media have have mentioned. Can more uh, can more be done to encourage adoption and in and how? Can I pose this question to Ben? Thanks. So I looked at the figures and I do recognize that while a lot of people are interested in privacy, it, this is of course a self-selecting group because the topic that we're discussing is traced together and privacy. So the group that's here would be particularly interested in privacy. But I think that one of the big things that we need to do to look at for any app to be widely accepted is good marketing. And it's a challenge to get anybody to install anything onto their phones. If anybody who is in the software industry will know that it's a challenge to get them to adopt anything, even if it's free, because so many apps are free. So what makes a person make the decision to say, I'm going to download something and put it on my phone, occupy my precious space, which is being used up by Candy Crush and Pokemon Go and you know, occupy my time. It's actually a marketing question as much as a privacy question. And if you think about it, there are so many apps that people are downloading and when they install the pages and pages of privacy uh, thing come up, do you accept that it has control over your microphone? Yes. Do you accept it has control over your camera? Yes. So for a lot of people, privacy isn't the first thing that comes to their mind when they install an app. It's actually, is there something in it for me in this app, whether it's the number of Pokemon I can catch and I can catch them all, or whether it's some time I'm going to spend, you know, putting um, extra sunglasses over my image or extra moustache and bunny ears. So long as they see some value of it, people will happily give over as much personal data as you like. Uh, so long as you give them some particular uh, benefit out of it that they can see. And unfortunately, the benefit of helping the general public trace coronavirus infected people is perhaps not a strong enough push for people or a strong enough draw for people to install the app. And maybe a more of a nudge or more of incentive needs to be put in to get people to install the app. Because as Harish has pointed out, the open source issue solves a lot of the privacy questions. If people actually go and read the reports that people have done on the open source code that's available, neutral experts from all over the world are tearing this code apart and they're saying, hey, look, you know, that it does what it says it does. It's not a major privacy issue compared to the other hundreds of apps that we are already installing on our phones. So I think it has to be also a push towards creating an incentive or a nudge for people to install. Right. Thanks, Ben. I think, yeah, there's this gamification uh, consideration that you know, perhaps can be considered or delve more into. Um, so, well, Brian is a technology, technology media and telecommunications lawyer. So, um, what, what personal information do, does like, you know, a heartland auntie or an uncle have to provide? What are, what are the implications on their personal privacy then? Um, for this particular product, when you decide to 
download it and to install it on your phone and to activate it. Uh, what it does is I think it takes your phone number and it creates a hash um, um, code and it locks that code uh, down onto a central server. Uh, and what happens uh, from then on is that every time your phone goes near uh, another phone where this program is running, uh, it recognizes that contact within a certain distance. Bluetooth has got a 10 meter um, uh, operating uh, range uh, and, and that is then locked down. Uh, that remains on your phone. That particular piece of information uh, remains on your phone. Uh, in the event where uh, you call in sick, uh, they would ask you to allow them to download that data that's on your phone. Uh, and all your contact uh, that has been recorded on your phone uh, with other users um, of the app who have come here to you uh, within the last 21 days uh, will all be reviewed. And so matched against the information on the server uh, for each program, uh, for each phone that has been locked down, uh, they will be able to determine who you've been in contact with. And insofar as the other person also has uh, um, installed uh, this particular app and has activated it and turned it on. Uh, so that, that's the only information that really gets exposed. Uh, your phone number, as well as who you've been in contact with within 10 meters or a 21 day period. Okay, thanks Brian. So from what I understand, um, the information that's, uh, that's gathered is stored locally on, on uh, the end user's mobile, mobile device. For like, like that's, the maximum of 21 days and then after, after that, it resets again. That's right. So the people tearing down the code can uh, identify that that information doesn't leave your phone, right, until you, you, you allow it to be downloaded. And two, uh, after that 21 days, I think some people calculated the formulas. It goes slightly beyond that, so they did some tweaking. Um, but yes, it removes itself from the phone after that amount of time. Uh, so they have done that as a... Arash has said they've opened up the code, there's nothing to hide. Uh, and so they've done the right moves there. But as we pointed out, uh, privacy is a necessary uh, condition, but not necessarily a sufficient condition. So what it means is people will say, okay, look, I need privacy to be addressed. That ticks the box. But in order for me to install that, I need a few boxes to be ticked. Privacy is just one of them. The other one, I think like Ben said, I need to be incentivized to do that. Uh, and we've got a good example here uh, from the gamification industry. And, uh, you know, two years ago, I, I went on a holiday to Taiwan. And, you know, I'm the kind of person, and I'm sure most of us are, we hate collecting receipts. You know, you buy an ice cream, you buy something, you know, they give you a receipt for that. And one of the funny things I noticed in Taiwan was everything I bought, they gave me a receipt. Whether it's for a drink, it's for a biscuit, I got a receipt for everything. And I was going to throw them away. But my tour guide saw me doing that. And he says, uh, if you don't mind, uh, why don't you give me those receipts you're about to throw away? I'm like, oh, sure. You know, I, you know, I can't find a dustbin to throw it anyway. And so he was collecting all these receipts. And I noticed uh, there were some boxes you know, that were placed around the place. And he was uh, depositing those boxes. Only when I came back to Singapore, somebody was talking to me about gamification. And, I re and he explained this. In Taiwan, they instituted a uh, legislation to collect GST. The problem is uh, Taiwan is very SME loaded and a lot of the SMEs have no incentive to issue receipts to collect the GST, right? You, know, you collect more money uh, for the government and you expand more costs. So the government came up with a pretty good uh, scenario. Uh, we will collect the receipts if people will register and Every now and then, we will issue a lucky draw and we'll give the winner a million dollars. Straight away, consumers began asking for those receipts. And businesses were happy to issue those receipts because they, it meant that they were getting more and more customers. And it's a win-win situation. The government gave away a million dollars every now and then uh, to, uh, to, to some lucky person uh, to whom the receipts were bought. But the government's GST collection went up three times, way in advance of the amount of money they gave up. Uh, way in excess of the amount of money they gave up. And so gamification, if applied correctly, I would say does work. And maybe if it takes one more of those boxes, 
to encourage people to uh, download and use the app, you know, I think that's uh, money well spent. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving to to um I, to a form of um, I, I mean that there's several forms of mainstream media that have mentioned uh, you know, like a degree of compulsion for digital tracking to be effective. So what are your thoughts around this, uh, Ben? So okay, looking at the Q and A, right? The Q and A is like really uh, very active now, and thinking about what else could be done, and maybe in terms of marketing also, what else could be done to get this accepted? I think one thing is that the when we look at the app, it and let's go back to the fundamentals of it and realize that it, it's a lot of things that make people decide to have an app, right? First of all, um, does it serve a, something that you like, uh, that you want? And Brian's got a great point there. If, there, if it were linked to Toto or some sponsor or there was some uh, tie up that say, hey, you know, everybody who's got this app is eligible for a lucky draw once a month. I, it would be, people would be downloading it like crazy. They would download it on multiple phones and they would go out with three phones to make sure that they get attacked. If you had a competition that you could actually see how many you know, people you were linked to on a thing and you got to catch them all uh, then and you get a prize for that or something even if it's point system then you have a high score people would download that if you had something which is uh, various various things that can give people an incentive to, to download or if you put it to, together with one of the other apps that people love to use like what one of my colleagues calls the Pauto app huh? the one service right where you can take picture of any um, PMD driver who's not doing a good job or somewhere in your town council, the, uh, some litter is not being collected, you can go and pauto, right? So people love to use that app. So you can bundle together with things like that. Um, so that's the, the incentive. But of course, some of the important factors are the battery life, battery life, battery life. Many people in the Q&A are talking about battery life. And that is something that has to be solved. And that is something, I think every app uh, has to go through this version one, version two. I think we all, if we cast our minds back and we think about the apps that we used to have years ago, there were other apps that were so, uh, that really also drained our batteries and it's, ah, I want to uninstall it. Some of us uninstalled face, tried to uninstall Facebook at some point because it was draining so much of our memory and so much of the battery life as well. So these things have to go through the process of improvement. And I think open source community can really help to give ideas. And since I understand, and Harish, correct me if I'm wrong, GovTech is also working with uh, Apple and Google to try and get the, the performance of the app to do better. Uh, I think because some people ask, why not use Apple and Google? I think it's a misunderstanding. Apple and Google have not developed an app. They have just opened up the API. Maybe Harish can, can elaborate on that. But if they work together with the Apple and Google, you can actually improve the performance. So it's a few things. You give an incentive, improve the performance, and then privacy. I mean, what else do we need to do about privacy? Is there already. So I think with these three things, we should be able to. Uh, uh, yeah, Harish, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Ben, I think uh, what you said is, is, is correct. The, the, the... Gamification, I feel, is a ideal way to get adoption going. I think we have to find a clever way to make that happen. Don't don't minimize the opportunity there. It may seem frivolous, but I think that's a real uh, winner for a lot of stuff. Uh, I, let me just take the question that was uh, posed on the Q and A, uh, and James Ng says uh, asks uh, that uh, we are in the midst of a national pandemic where lives can be lost, and why must privacy take precedence when installing the app and so on? I think we have to always take consideration of privacy. If you don't, you 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 make choices saying I, I don't really care about it. I, you know I'll just do this. The thing is, at some point, it will come to roost where you actually have a serious issue to deal with, and at which point you say, oh, I've already agreed to that, and therefore my privacy is gone. Now. Uh, it is a constant battle trying to find a balance. It is always a constant battle. And this is a battle that all of us have to fight. It's not just for the app developer. It's not just for the agency that created. It's not just for us speaking here. Each one of us have to understand what is it that we are giving. 
because what happens today for this particular pandemic, we are using this app. I am quite thankful that this app has got actually an expiry date. Uh, I, I, if I remember right in the FAQ for Trace Together, uh, it does say that six months after the uh, pandemic is off, this app is essentially useless. You can go ahead and delete it and end of story. Uh, that is actually a very, very important thing to have. We need to have a way to say, you must be able to sunset some of these applications. You should not be able, you should not be carrying it on and on and on. And uh, I, I would draw one caution to adding additional capability functionality to this particular app, because once you do that, there is feature creep there. I want to, you know, add this additional stuff. I want to add additional, uh, the other thing. Uh, one of the comments I heard over the weekend was uh, now that you want to have safe entry as an option, why can't I have my uh, this trace together app to also have a QR code reader so I can use the same app and uh, QR, read the QR code and then I, I go in. That That is a possibility, but you know I think that's a feature creep that do we really want to have additional functionality to a very specific, very targeted and very precisely uh, uh, designed tool for a particular purpose. Because QR apps, uh, QR code readers are a dime a dozen. It do, it's not necessary to include that as well. But it's a, it's a fair comment to make that why don't have it. But I think the thing is we'd want to uh, guard against additional stuff because when you have additional stuff, there could be other kinds of things that may creep in. You want to minimize exposure for potential, uh, potential for uh, someone breaking into the phone. Uh, the fact that we, we open sourced it in the process, we also, uh, together with the developers, recognized that there were some ways of coding that could have been done better. And to their credit, they improved the security coding, uh, security stand, uh, stature of the particular application, which is fantastic. And now that the code is out there, a lot of people are looking at it. And, and not only in Singapore, uh, the same code base is used in Australia. And they have looked at it, they have open sourced the uh, same thing as well in Australia. And, the Australian community has looked at it. And so there's a lot of these things happen. The point is, what I'm trying to make is, privacy is not something that is, uh, you can always, uh, you can say, uh, I don't really care about it now. You must consciously make the choice. If you don't do it, when something comes back to you, you have really no excuse, no reason to uh, raise your hackle saying, oh, you didn't ask me, or, you know, I would not have agreed if that was the case and so on. I, it, the whole, it, it's, uh, we use all of us to step up to the plate on that. Uh, Arash mentioned a good point. Uh, when you want to do a product and you know that there are going to be privacy concerns, uh, the methodology in which you undertake that is what they call privacy by design. Uh, that means that when you design the product before it's, you even start coding it, you think about the data protection issues and you code that in. You don't design the product and then you worry about the data protection issues after that. Uh, you do all that work in the design phase before you sit down and start writing that code. Um, and you know, I, I do have to mention this, you know, there are a lot of other countries who have better technology people, a lot more software coders, um, and they haven't even started on this. And part of that, and it's not like they don't have a big issue with uh, COVID-19. Some of these countries have a lot of bigger issues, uh, but for them because they are talking so much about the issues and worrying about the data protection, going, some even going for litigation and stuff like that, even before the stuff is written, uh, you know, that also kind of misses the point. I think the balance is also about speed as well as, uh, you know, balancing uh, personal data protection. Uh, and that's something we're trying to do. It's again, a first for many of us. And you see some of that uh, playing out in full in this discussion. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so yeah, we are, we are receiving a lot of uh, questions from the audience today. Uh, just to keep things a bit fresh, um, I'm gonna start um, a poll shortly. You should be able to see this uh, popping up on the screen now. So please, um, yeah, we can start your, your voting process and we'll come back to, to circle back and see what your response is.
So we are seeing oh, about forty really? percent of the audience saying that yes, they have um, they may consider it right now. Uh, thirty percent, I'm sure. Thirty percent, no. And if there's an incentive uh, about reconsidering, maybe fifty percent will say yes. While the rest are still, you know, like sitting on the sitting on the fence, so to speak. So um, yeah, Harish. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I got, yeah, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, result from the poll. Uh, th there was a, a, a person who was asking a question on the Q&A, uh, Vernon, uh, Vernon Tay, uh, as saying that this is uh, technical, uh, this talk is too technical. Um, I, there are, I, I, I appreciate what you're, where you're coming from. The, the challenge is some of these things, we really need to sit down and, and and tease out the issues behind it. Some of these issues are a technical issue, uh, the technicality of privacy, the technicality of why the code has to be open, the technicality of uh, how do data get translated uh, from place to place. So there are some of these things which we really cannot run away from. So I hope that uh, you know you, you, you will be able to uh, appreciate some of these uh, uh, aspects about it. And you know. And I, I'm more than happy to take questions uh, after the entire session is over. If you have anything that uh, uh, Bernard that uh, you want to ask, okay. Um, yeah, if there's no further inputs from the uh, from the panelists, I'll open the floor up for Q and A to the audience. I've uh, yeah, my, I see Alfred um, Alfred Hong. One of our guests here that has a question. Uh, Dylan, could you help channel that question over? Hi, Shemin, certainly. There's a question from Alfred to Benjamin. What do you feel could have been done better to have made the marketing or the trace good together app more successful uh, besides making it like a Pokemon game? Now I wish I really knew how to make an app go viral because then I would retire rich and famous or at least rich. <laughs> but other than that, um, I think it's the things that we mentioned and uh, some of it does not require adding functionality like um, if you add a lucky draw or something like that. You, The other one is to really make it um, by some policy moves, whether it's a, um, there's some more uh, places that, you know, people will check, hey, you know, you got safe entry. Do you also have trace together installed? But that would make it somewhat more worth the compulsory side. But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of these moves that could actually do. The marketing part of it, it has to have some uh, gamification part. I think somebody else asked a question which is quite related to that. I'm trying to see where it is. Finding out about the um, what are the fundamental needs, right, of Singaporeans. Um, make it as popular as bubble tea. But I think we all wish we knew how to do that. Harish, Brian, no? Yeah. That if we knew I mean, for all you know, if you go to the bubble tea shop and they're open and you show the app is running and you get a discount. You know, yes, if you could it, use it, that as your income, yeah, you know, I'm sure you, can, you might do that. <laughs> if you can get 10% off whatever purchases and if you show your things together app, that's it. Yeah, done. That's it. You, and you, you good to go everywhere. Right, so. Yeah, <laughs> becomes the so, yeah. Uh, See, no additional functionality needed. See, Harish. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's yeah. It, we we have to appeal to that. That the playfulness of people as well. Mm. In, in these times, I think we need to have that bit of humor, that bit of uh, uh, competition to you know to to get something out of uh, you know the, the dire uh, situation we are in. I think these are the small little incentives that we can potentially do. Um, and, and and while we are talking about the incentive, one of the, uh, the there was another question by uh, Geeling uh, asking about battery life as an issue. Uh, Battery life, I, I think Ben has already spoken, even Brian uh, to an ex some extent. The battery is always going to be an issue, no matter what you do with it. Uh, and the nature of uh, uh, this particular solution, in the case of Trace Together, it uses Bluetooth, and Bluetooth uh, low energy is the specific technology that has been used. Uh, 
there will always be an issue and there is really, it's not an open source thing whether we, the open source community can do something with it to fix it. It's got to do with the underlying base uh, hardware and the related uh, functionality within the hardware. There is only so much you can do, unfortunately. Uh, and they are trying very hard. Now, the collaboration potentially with uh, Apple and Google to manage some of those components may actually help. But I think going by what has already been published from Apple, uh, that the battery issue will continue to be uh, uh, not something that they can they themselves can address because it's actually a hardware related component. Mm -hmm. um, so what else can we do to make it better? Uh, there are many ideas floating around, some trials and are going on, but again, battery is a battery issue. And you know, that's one of the things, you know, maybe you, you show that your app is running on your phone and you go to uh, the supermarket. All right, you have an app running on, I give you a, a charger, uh, a battery pack, there you go. So, you know, you accumulate battery packs. So that becomes another incentive. I mean, I mean there, there are many ways you probably can address some of these things as well. Right. So um, to the audience, if um, if you look at the Q and A portion, there's a function that you can actually upvote some of the questions that you that you think you that you think deserves you know further um, further details. Yeah. So feel feel free to use that option. You know, building on what Harish said, right? There is an opportunity right now. If you are a small business owner and you're watching this, if you are a small business owner and you're watching this, this is an opportunity because if you are going to try something like what Harish suggested. You're, it's going to be a new story. If during the easing of restrictions, your sh shop gets to open, and now you say, oh, everyone who shows me your Trace Together app, I get a discount, that you become a new story. You're definitely going to get featured because it's reporters are going to say, huh, how come you're doing this? Then you get to interview you, you get to show your civic consciousness, and then you, your business gets promoted. I'm just... Okay, just saying, just an idea, basing off what, what Harish has said. So, small business owners, over to you. I mean, even large business owners, right? Or oh, even large business owners, yeah. You know, or Brian, even when you get into a cab, if you show that app is running, you get a discount. Why not? Uh, get into one of the you know, right hiring uh, services. Yeah. Show that your app is running. You if one discount. of the food delivery companies decides to do it now, if anybody knows, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, opportunities. Yeah, you, you have the distribution of the reusable masks coming up from vending machines, right? And yeah. a lot of people are thinking, okay, it's a vending machine, I have to go and press button, right? What if you use that uh, machine's ability to recognize a user based on Bluetooth and dispensing the, um, the, the, the mask uh, upon detecting the the user and maybe getting a, a, a click on the by the user on his phone. Yeah, put the Bluetooth receiver on the vending machine. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, not, not you can be creative. Receiver, it's actually exchanging the idea, the ideas yeah. between them, just like any other person. Yeah. There you go. And, uh, yeah. So I, I, I think you can be creative. And look, we are in Singapore, we are blessed to have with us, you know, some of the best apps in the region. There must be some pretty good people out there who know how to market these apps. Um and with ideas and so you know, we give it a like Harish and we keep working at it. You know, we can. I, I think results can be created. Again, we look at that poll that has been taken. Uh, the second question. Forty-six percent of the people say they would reconsider if there's an incentive. Thirty-five percent, additional thirty-five percent said it depends. I guess it depends on how good the incentive is, right? <laughs> uh, and so you get that right. That's eighty-one percent of people who have currently said no who would change their minds. You know, that's. That's, that, that's pretty instructive. Really, this is not a difficult problem to solve. Honestly, it's not a difficult problem to solve. It's very easy to solve. And, and it doesn't even have to come uh, top down from any, any government agency, nothing. It is really up to the, as, as ben, uh, Brian was, uh, sorry, ben was saying about the SMEs. Yeah, I want SMEs. You can do this. You know, incentivize people. Say that this is what you're going to do. And, and for that matter, who knows? I mean, uh, if, if somebody from government is listening to it, maybe they can give some discounts to these uh, SMEs who give these kinds of uh, incentives to, to, to people who come by, you know? So it, it, it's a win-win-win for everyone. So I feel that makes it a lot more uh, easier. Right. 
So um, looking down, down the list of Q&A, uh, there's a question from Paul Widen. So he has mentioned that other countries, for example, like India, Australia, have their, have their own version of uh, Trace Together. And in fact, their download rates are, uh, I, I mean, it ranges from Iceland being at 40%, and then you have like India at 20%. So he asked about, um, are there different approaches that uh, government have taken, the governments have taken? And any other lessons that perhaps GovTech can learn from there? I think this is a tough question because it's really different countries having different laws and jurisdictions and you know, how, do you, how do you square all these things together? And different um, consumer behavior as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I, I think in the case of uh, uh, one of the countries I was mentioned, which is India, I think they mandated the requirement as well uh, that you must have it. You have to have it installed. And you know, that becomes a, a completely different kettle of fish because it does assume many, many things. Like you have a device, you have a phone. The phone is recent enough that you can actually install this. And it's recent enough that you can actually run the uh, Bluetooth uh, low energy and so on and so on. So there's, there are many constraints that has to be. And so they have to look at that subset of uh, uh, people who, don't, uh, who are, are asked to uh, install. Yeah. Installation, I, I mean, downloading and installation is just step one. Step two is actually turning it on. Yeah. Now, I can always install it on a phone and then leave it at home and you know switch it off or leave it on and leave it there. And I take another phone and off I go. I could do that. So uh, it becomes a, a tricky situation from that perspective. So though Singapore, uh, Iceland, uh, Australia have made it all uh, optional. You can delete it anytime you want and all data is gone. So mm. it, it helps in many ways to uh, manage some of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the trade-offs that you have to make because you know you are not now forced to uh, have to try and comply and yet you know you are not complying and what happens if you don't what if i can't afford a phone uh, am i going to be penalized for that and, and so on so there are many of these things that needs to be uh, uh, addressed yeah. as well i i think from the the legal point of view uh, we, we did touch upon uh, making this mandatory um, and there's a fine difference between laws which allow uh, digital tracking. Those are primarily based on tools that you already have. So whether it is uh, cameras that are placed uh, around town or whether it is a uh, monitoring of uh, ISP traffic, um, that's a whole different kettle of fish uh, when you talk about uh, mandating someone to first install an app on their phones, their personal devices, and then to turn that on. That becomes uh, actually a different word, surveillance actually. You're asking them to allow themselves to be surveilled, everyone. And when you sur surveil someone, when you, you conduct surveillance, you actually don't know what you're trying to, to, to get uh, or you will end up getting over time. So for instance, you may think you only want to look for who he's been in contact with, but then you get other information like Okay, he's, uh, he seems to be visiting a lot of different women uh, at night, you know? What does that tell you? Uh, stuff like that, and, and you open a whole different kettle of fish, you know, so you might, you might end up with more problems you want. In, in terms of Singapore laws, we do have some laws which allow for surveillance. These are primarily cybersecurity laws on very specific pieces of equipment. The government can require uh, devices or software to be installed to carry out surveillance uh, in order to protect those services. But to roll that across the population, that's something else we're talking about here. So, and I, I think that's a step rightfully that uh, will have to be taken very, very carefully. If I expand on what Brian has said, right? And once something becomes compulsory, then there is a risk of creating an environment where people want to comply with the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. So they will do as what Harish suggested. They will install, but not switch on Bluetooth. Install, leave it on, but don't bring it out with them. So there has to be, uh, people have to have their buy-in. It's not the magic, it's not magic to install it. The usefulness of this is to actually install it and want to use it. And 
actually uh, talk about the marketing part of it, right? There is uh, some points where we cannot go to. In Australia, there are some concerns that it has been a bit oversold. And you can see that, oh, if you want the pubs to be open, you got to have this app. So it becomes to equate, oh, once these are open, we can go to the pubs again. Is that necessary? the link that we want? We don't necessarily want to have a link like that. We don't want the elderly, and I think some people, the Q&A have mentioned, how do we help the elderly? We have, well, we simplify it. We also cannot oversell it and let them think that, oh, once I have this app, magically, you know, I'm protected from the virus. Or magically, if I'm near a person with virus, it will warn me. That's not the kind of message that should be shared. So it's going to be important to, to be able to find a balance between not forcing people into a situation where they try to avoid, but also not overselling that people think that it's going to be a magic bullet. And even GovTech leaders have actually blog posted that, you know, this is not magic. Huh? It's a tool to help contact tracing humans to do their work. So in between that, to create a buy-in for people to want to use it and to comply with all the other emergency measures that will help. If I may add one bit to that as well. Uh, to the credit of uh, the uh, GovTech uh, solution, uh, I, I'm not praising GovTech because uh, you know trying to praise it for anything. It's just you know in my mind when the code was opened up, yeah, it looked very clean, it looked very decent, it, it was very acceptable. But in the design of it, there was a lot of thinking that went behind the idea of. Uh, um, a human in the loop as far as contact tracing is concerned. So just because uh, I have data on my phone around people who may I may have come across uh, close enough to me and if I get to, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have to go to the hospital and, 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 and extract the data out of my phone, uh, the, the fact is that the, 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 the entire scheme it, it works in a process where the contact tracing is actually done by humans to call up uh, people to ensure two things don't happen. The first thing is a false positive. That means uh, you, you think this person is not uh, actually in, infected, by actually, but he is or she is. And false negatives. You, know, uh, you, are, you think the person doesn't have it, but you, you, you are contacting the person anyway. Now, if you use software and hardware and technology to do that kind of stuff, it may or may not be successful uh, uh, to the extent that we want it to be. And you don't have the human connection here because this is actually a very serious problem. Do I want a, a random phone number to, or a random system to say, hey, you could be infected? I don't think I want to have that. I would like to have someone call me or inform me or my next of kin or whoever it might be. If there is a problem, uh, do you think this person could have been infected? Uh, are you able to share you know, your contact information if there is in your phone, if you've loaded that application? Then they can triangulate and try and figure out who else may have been exposed. That, that to me is a very, very fair thing to do. And it's a lot more calming from a personal perspective because it's not a, a piece of hardware that says, oh, you're, you're, you're up, uh, your number is up, you're dead. No, it is different. There's a second aspect to this as well. Contact tracing is, is a human in the loop process in Singapore and in many places as well, but it's very important to have that. The second part to it is there is a longer period of ingestation period in terms of before someone gets to be infected and, and actually down with, uh, with, with COVID. So that is a long period, nine, nine to 14 days. That's a long period. You are, there's no way that I'm going to be able to be pinged on my phone to say, oh, so-and-so who's sitting next to me is infected. That's not going to happen because of the time uh, of the time frame. So there are many constraints that we have to work with, uh, and I think that's an important component to think about. Okay, right. Um, so, to, to Dylan, are there any questions uh, from the audience that you know deserves question, uh, answering? Perhaps uh, yeah. there are some questions that have been upvoted. Uh, yes, there is the, okay, the right. one question now, which maybe let me paraphrase for a little while. Okay, let's say to, yesterday night, I actually sneaked over to Shi Ming's house for a packet of nasi lemak cooked by him, and nobody knows about it. But next day, the Singapore police force knocked on my door and said I broke the circuit breaker restriction. And in, of course, we, we both deny it. But then they said, can they tr pull out the data from the Trace Together app, which both me and Shi Ming have, to prove that we were together last night? So I think maybe that's a question for Brian first. 
Yeah, I I think uh, if I recall the limitation or the ability to pull the data off the app uh, is only if there are medical reasons. So if one of you is ill, uh, then they will pull the data from that person's uh, app, with that person's phone. Yeah, with his permission because his permission is 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 granted. Uh, so they won't. Uh, yeah, so that, that particular scenario won't happen. Uh, but if you just change that slightly, let's say you did become ill, and so they pull out all of that, and they discover that um, you spend a lot of time with someone at a time when you were at home. Uh, and maybe with further investigation, they found that uh, there's a breach of uh, the circuit breaker, right? Uh, then I think this would kind of be a case where well, one, you have uh, broken the circuit breaker, and two, uh, you've provided them with the ability to prove that you broken the circuit breaker. So, yeah, uh, it's just too bad that you got caught. So, uh, I think also, we're the also end. need to realize that there are a lot of um, there's a lot of human intelligence that goes into uh, prosecution and arrest because uh, you know. You don't need to worry about an app because you have neighbors. Eh? So your neighbors are more likely to to snitch on you than to worry about your app. That's so, true. Yeah, you are in greater danger of your neighbors. We are nearing the end of the of, of this webinar. Perhaps we can take another one or two more questions from the audience. Dylan, are there any questions that have been upvoted? Okay, uh, the next question. Uh, James has asked, is the app, once is it, once it's deleted from the phone, will there be still traces of the codes that is in the phone that can be pulled out or is the tracking actually still active? Okay, let me try and answer that. Um, I, just, just to be uh, very clear, when something is deleted from the phone, what generally it means is that, or, or from a computer for that matter, what generally it means is that the, the 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 entry in the the system directory, so to speak, says that this particular app does is not there. Now, whether or not the data of the app is still sitting in the system, that all depends on how uh, delete of an app uh, works in the respective devices. Uh, whether when you click on delete the uh, app, whether it actually completely goes to all the locations where the app is stored within the phone and puts writes a zero to it or writes a one to it so it nullifies the whole thing. Uh, that is something that is dependent on the operating system. It's nothing to do with uh, the app itself because the app doesn't have control over that portion. But let's let's walk this through to the next step. I delete the, the app that is sitting in my phone today and I delete it now and I reload it I'll get a fresh copy of the app on my phone and now I register all the data that was in the previous installation of uh, Trace Together on my phone will essentially be overwritten. It, it, is, it, it never went anywhere because I'm okay, I, I didn't send it to the Ministry of Health. Whatever that was sitting on my phone is overwritten. Now, can someone who does some forensics to open up my phone and try and put some electronics around it and trying to suck out the data, can't find any traces of it? Yeah, that's possible. It is possible. We can't say no. Uh, that's just how uh, systems like this work. So the answer is a, it's a qualified uh, yes and a qualified no. And because I think Brian, we in the past we've done some work with digital forensics people, right? Yep. You know that, yep. Um, if you put it into a, one of those celebrate machines, right? Boom, sucks everything out, and then you can basically see that all the other apps which have been tracing your location, like your um, I hesitate to say your Pokemon Go has been tracing your location all along or your running app, your jogging app has been tracing your location all along and you know all of that is still all somewhere on your phone which even after you uninstalled your running app mm -hmm. so you already have uh, if you are concerned about that I think you have to really look seriously at the phone and the rest of your phone mm. and, and, and in any case look if you have uninstalled the app, uh, it really has to be a very good reason uh, why law enforcement will be able to ask for an order for you to hand over your phone.
for them to extract all that data on the off chance that uh, you might have that data lingering around. I mean, they won't do this for the general population. Uh, maybe if you are some kind of, you know, mega level terrorist or you know, some big time criminal, yes, they would expand their resources to do that. But for the majority of us, trying to get an order uh, for a phone, which is your phone, uh, to be able to extract that data is an extremely uh, severe step and it's not always uh, obtained. Um, don't forget, if somebody accesses your phone to extract the data without your permission, that becomes a compu computer misuse act uh, issue to begin with, right? So, uh, you know, not 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 in every case. I mean, you got you really have to be a really bad guy for them to, to pay that much attention to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I've just looked through the list of Q and A. Um, I, I see similar recurring themes around those questions. Um, since you're nearing the end of this uh, webinar today, um, I apologize once again that we cannot answer everybody's question, but we will try to summarize our replies via our Facebook Live event. Uh, and to, to end this off, we, we invite our, inter our attendees to fill in a short survey on future webinar topics that you, that you, you would like to hear. Any other uh, closing thoughts from, from the panelists today? Uh, if, if I may just add, uh, show one, one screen uh, uh, about some of the constraints and considerations that one may have in looking at all the various activities uh, and people, uh, what they have tried to do across the world in terms of uh, uh, app sharing, uh, location, uh, contact tracing type of solutions. So let me just pull that up and uh, let me share that. Um, I hope you're seeing uh, uh, the screenshot, uh, how solutions stack up. These are some, I just picked up some of the apps that are out there. And I particularly like the, the second last one, Safe Path. Uh, this is a, a, a technology that was uh, very similar to Trace Together uh, and safe, similar to COVID Safe, but it also does GPS related uh, location tracing. So if you are in the business of, uh, you know, walking around and going for runs and all that, that you are tracking your location. The data that is collected entirely is kept completely decentralized. So that's so you see the decentralized column. Uh, the data is only stored on the phone and only uh, when you need to, you then upload it to a central server and then try and figure out something uh, to, uh, to do with it. But I would encourage you know the, uh, the people who are attending this webinar to have a look at all the other solutions. Some of them are very interesting. And I kind of personally like Safe Path because it, it, it actually forces the privacy question down to me deciding every single step of the way. Uh, in the case of Trace Together, one step I had to give up, which is I have to give my phone number to uh, to the Ministry of Health when I register this app. So that one detail had to be given up. Given up. Uh, safe, uh, safe Path and uh, does not do that, doesn't require that. COVID Safe in the case of Australia uh, does pretty much exactly what Singapore does, but they also do ask for your full name, your range of your age, it doesn't ask you for a specific, uh, precise age, and your postal code. Now, what uh, the Australians uh, uh, do say is that they don't really care what name you put in, what age you put in, what postcode you put in. So I don't know why they ask that uh, anyway. So uh, there's no verification that has been done because they essentially need to authenticate that particular installation by sending a phone number and then getting an SMS. So I just want to share this because there's a lot of applications out there. If you go to Wikipedia page, you will find there's a lot of people who have put in a lot of effort around the world trying to solve this very, simple, very important uh, uh, societal issue. Thank you. So um, yeah, thank you, Harish. If you have um, any questions uh, regarding, you know, like the, the code of, uh, you know, Blue Trace, open source, feel free to approach uh, Harish. Um, and if there's no further questions from the audience, I would like to close today's webinar. So thank you very much for taking time off. Stay safe and stay home, Singapore. Take care.